Kim Jong-un warning that the recent missile fired over Japan was just a preview of what's to come. Why the U.N. is now saying enough is enough. We are all denouncing North Korea's outrageous act against another U.N. member state, Japan. We are all demanding North Korea stop any future missile launches. We are all demanding North Korea abandon its nuclear weapons. The world is united against North Korea. There is no doubt about that. It is time for the North Korean regime to recognize the danger they are putting themselves in. The United States will not allow their lawlessness to continue. And the rest of the world is with us. U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley saying the U.N. has had enough of North Korea's provo uh, provocations. As tensions continue to escalate just a day after launching a missile over Japan, Kim Jong-un now making more threats, saying that launch was just a prelude to an attack, potentially, on the U.S. territory at Guam. That makes it the second threat by North Korea to strike Guam this month. The president taking to Twitter this morning this saying, quote, the U.S. has been talking to North Korea and paying them extortion money for years, 25 years. Talking is not the answer. Sir. Joining me now, author of the new book, Judgment at Appomattox. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Hit uh, bookstores yesterday. Fox News strategic analyst, retired Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters. Good to see you, sir. Shannon, it is always good to see you, even on trying, trying times like these. Yeah. Oh, okay, let's start with what Ambassador Haley was saying there. She said, we've had enough. The U.S. has had enough, and the world is supporting it, us in this. We're not going to tolerate the law lawlessness anymore. So what does that mean? How do we stop this? Well, we don't know. And clearly, at this point, it appears that the only way to stop it is military action, which no sane person wants. We, we have let this problem go on for so very long through multiple presidential administrations, back when it could have been stopped more easily, that now you have a nuclear armed state struggling to get the delivery means to deliver those nukes all the way to the continental United States. And nothing we do, whether it's the possibility of talks, whether it's aid, whether it's embargoes, nothing has worked. And the bottom line of that is, people don't understand how desperate Kim Jong-un is. North Korea is dirt poor. His vaunted military is not nearly as powerful as the South Korean military is, to say nothing of the U.S. He is struggling to hold this decayed, degenerate regime together, and he sees nukes as his last resort, his blackmail, his threat. Every time he does one of these launches, I get the same question. You probably get it, too, about why we don't shoot them down. But you've sent me some interesting notes on why that's maybe not the best idea. Well, yeah, there are several reasons we don't shoot them down. One is that you learn the most about their capabilities from the reentry phase, the last phase of the missile when it's coming down. Theirs, theirs tend to break apart. And they're also, we find out how inaccurate they are. Also, of course, shooting them down, it would cost us a, a lot of money to shoot them down. But that's not the big reason. The big reason is we're, we're thinking this through. Now, if it were headed toward Guam or toward a Japanese city, we would try to shoot it down. But if the trajectory is taking it over the ocean, if we sh tried to shoot it down and our missile didn't hit the target, then it encourages Kim Jong-un to believe that, ah, oh, the Americans can't shoot him down. Well, see, we've had successful missile tests, anti-missile tests. We've had unsuccessful ones. But the cliche is true that this is like trying to hit a bullet with a bullet. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly complex technology. It is harder than what NASA had to do for the moonshot. So we don't want to encourage Kim. But in a crisis, certainly we'd pull out all the stops, and we'd take out at least some of their missiles. Whether we could take them out, all out at this point, we don't know, but we're working on it. Well, and asked about this situation, uh, senior advisor Kellyanne Conway had this to say about how the president views this. The president obviously says all options are on the table. I think the president will do what he does, what he's always promised to do all along, which is consult with his larger security team and not broadcast ahead of time what he'll do. All options on the table, and he's not going to broadcast ahead of time. Well, I don't want him to broadcast ahead of time. That was a terrible mistake the Obama administration made on almost every issue. But when you say all options are on the table, at some point, you may have to be a little more specific, unfortunately, because the North Korean problem, again, has metastasized to the point that it may take nuclear weapons to destroy their nuclear program. They buried burrowed so deep underground, dispersed it so widely. So again, there is no good solution, only less bad answers. And if North Korea goes for Guam, 
we may have to respond militarily. I want to make sure on another topic that we mention your new book out. It's all about the Civil War. I mean, you're a best-selling author, if people are, are, don't already know that about you. It's a novel, but you say with the current debate that we're having, which is very heated on this topic, there are people all on all sides who really don't know everything that they're attempting to talk about and debate, and we can all learn a lot more. Well, that's absolutely true, and although it's technically a novel, it's very accurate. It's a a fun way to learn your history in a sort of a narrative form. But the important thing in this debate about Confederate statues, and I'm a born Yankee, um, I try to see through the eyes of the people of the time. And they were complex human beings. It wasn't as, no pun intended, black and white as we make it out to be. So I wish people on both the far left and the extreme right would just learn the facts. Learn about the Civil War before you lecture us all on it. We can all do better by that. And this is, as you say, an entertaining way to do it. I'm Colonel Peters. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Shannon. Good to see you. Eric. Thank you, Shannon and Colonel. Well, back to the top story of the morning. Hurricane Harvey making landfall again, this time along the Texas border with Louisiana. Coming right up. We'll have the senior senator of that state, Senator Bill Cassidy, will join us on who his state is doing. Meanwhile, over in Texas, we're hearing nearly all of Houston's reservoirs are close to cresting as tens of thousands of evacuees flood into shelters all across Texas, many of them reaching their breaking point. A live update straight ahead. This is what we call a mega shelter, you know, it's, it's large. And so, any, you know, we basically have built a small town here in two days. It will be an extended period of time, but we will be here for folks as long as they need us. Tropical Storm Harvey making landfall for the second time this morning, hitting southwest Louisiana as the floodwaters in Texas continue to rise. Storms now being blamed for at least 18 deaths. The Red Cross says more than 17,000 people have been forced into shelters, some of which are operating now at double capacity. Texas Governor Greg Abbott says his state will continue to rise to the challenge. This is Texas. It is Texans helping Texans. And this is uh, the everyday heroism uh, that we see across the state of Texas all the time. Uh, it's just that uh, when uh, the uh, worldwide uh, media focus is on it, the world gets to see what Texans do every single day. Mm -hmm. Caroline Chively is reporting live from the George R. Brown Convention Center in Houston. All right. Um, good morning, Caroline. What can you tell us about the numbers of the shelter there? 11,000, that's what they hit here last night of registered people. Take a look, people are still trickling in and out. Uh, but that's some folks just getting out of the shelter because the sun is finally shining here in Houston. The Red Cross tells us there are now 32,000 evacuees in 230 shelters across Texas run by the Red Cross. They've now opened three more shelters in Louisiana. Senator Ted Cruz was here serving food to evacuees last hour. Earlier today, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie ripped into Cruz for his vote against a federal aid package for Superstorm Sandy back in 2012. Christie called Cruz disgusting and said he told reprehensible lies for saying the Sandy aid bill was filled with pork. Cruz shot back here at the shelter. It's really sad that there's some politicians that, that seem very desperate uh, to get their name in the news and, and, and are tossing around all sorts of political insults with people whose lives are in danger. President Trump says he expects a federal aid package to get through Congress quite quickly. Cruz tells us he and the rest of the Texas delegation will be putting that together, no pork included. Back to you, Shannon. All right, Caroline Shively, live on the ground for us there. Thank you, Caroline. And Harvey's making landfall again this morning. It moved its way from Texas onto the Louisiana border at this hour. Joining us is the senior senator from Louisiana, Senator Bill Cassidy. He helped out during Katrina 12 years and one day ago. That, of course, so fresh in our minds. Senator, uh, good to talk to you. Uh, the good news this morning for your state, less rain is expected, one to three inches, at most six in some spots. Uh, are you confident that your state is prepared? Yes, I am absolutely confident. I hate to say it, but Louisiana's had lots of practice with this since Katrina, and we know what to do. Now, that said, when what happens as in, happens in South Texas, there's almost nothing you can do except evacuate. But still, we are prepared. We have things forward positioned. We have shelters that will be ready to go. There's already been some rescues in uh, southwest Louisiana, uh, according to the sheriff in Calcasieu, uh, Calcasieu Parish, but we feel prepared. There are about 200 people in a, uh, right now in a shelter in Lake Charles. What do you see is the greatest difference between the response today and what happened 12 years ago during Katrina? So I think everybody has picked up their game. 
and we, again, forward position resources, things such as trucks carrying gasoline so that if people do have to evacuate, then we have the trucks ready to fill the gas station so that you don't run out. As one example, I was uh, last night with somebody from the LSU Health Science Center in Shreveport. They had gotten a word from the governor to create a shelter for 3,400 people. These are actually Texans, but the fact that we are standing it up, it could receive folks from Louisiana as well. And if you will, whereas before that was done almost on an ad hoc basis, now it's kind of like we're ready. We know how to set it up. We have systems. Put it in gear. So we've learned our lesson. Uh, Port Arthur and Beaumont in, in Texas, underwater, uh, a, a real crisis there. Are you prepared to accept uh, folks from those areas into the state, into your shelters? Absolutely. And let me just say, uh, our, our, all across the nation after Katrina, people receive folks from the flooded areas of New Orleans and surrounding parishes. And we still are very emotional about that and very thankful for our fellow Americans. And whatever we can do to pay it back and pay it forward, we will absolutely do yeah, we have a, a fire truck here in New York from the, the great people of your state. It's got the insignia on it. And, and we talk about coordination. We look back to Governor Kathleen Blanco and, and Mayor Ray Nagin. I mean, it took a while for the National Guard to be deployed back during Katrina. Do you see a greater coordination now between the federal authorities and the state authorities, as you said, to, to, to try to prevent the worst from happening? Totally. And, and for example, what Congress has done, uh, we, we've learned that after Katrina, when they took it an emergency or appropriation to give FEMA the resources that it needed, Congress has now set up a fund which, as soon as the disaster happens, FEMA can start pulling down dollars. It does not need a special appropriation. So we have forward positioned, if you will, the uh, financial assets needed for FEMA to do its work. FEMA, which, which uh, will we'll just tell you, they've always got more work to do to make it better. But they've come a long way since that initial response to Katrina, becoming far more effective. And lastly, one of the phone calls I had was with an admiral of the Coast Guard. Who The Coast Guard, again, we in Louisiana become emotional speaking about them. They rescued so many, but they've continued to do their good work in the Galveston-Houston area. And they also will be given all the resources they need to continue that good work. It just shows the wonderful, genuine, and sincere efforts by the first responders, volunteers, and others uh, trying to help out our, our fellow Americans who are stricken at this time of crisis and emergency. And finally, Senator, back, uh, you're a physician, you're a gastro. Tell us about uh, your efforts back during Katrina 12 years ago. What, you set up a hospital in an empty Kmart? Yeah, it was, uh, I recall very well, the, the chancellor of LSU had put out a kind of, if you're a doctor or nurse, please come help. I had gone in, helped at uh, one of the LSU facilities, and just when that was just all righted and I felt like, well, probably my job's over, I got a call from the governor's office asking if we would set up an emergency flow facility. And, uh, and folks from our community, uh, within, I think, 24 hours, uh, took an abandoned Kmart, dirty and grimy, without electricity, and turned it into something that was clean, well-lit, Lots of electricity, uh, good systems in place to receive those folks being evacuated out of the flooded areas. And it's just a hats off to our spirit of community that we were able to get that standing within 24 hours uh, to, to serve our fellow man. Selfless giving uh, and volunteering by the senator and by so many others during Katrina 12 years ago. And that is exactly what we're seeing, that same spirit and faith today. Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, thank you so much. And good luck to you thank and you. your state over the next few days. Thank you very much. Of course. Shannon? Well, we're getting an update on that riot that broke out earlier this year outside the Turkish ambassador's residence in Washington, D.C., who is now being indicted in connection with the violence there. Plus, did Charlottesville law enforcement basically give a heads up and get one from the feds before the white supremacist rally turned deadly? Well, there's a bombshell report we're being told that's raising some new questions about the police response. The city is hurting, and I'm not sure exactly how the healing trickles down from D.C., but we need answers. 